भगवते वासुदेवाय नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय यथाशयन आत्मा विषयन फल अनुभुक्तेप्य सत्यर्थे तथाप्नोत्याबुधो भव यथाशयान आत्मा विषयन फल अनुपुक्तेप्य सत्यर्थे तथाप्नोत्याबुधो भव यथाशयान आत्मा विषयन फल अनुपुक्तेप्य सत्यर्थे तथाप्नोत्यबुधो भव Yatha, as Shayana, a sleeping person, Atmanam, himself, Vishayan, sense objects, Palam, the fruits, Eva, indeed, Cha, also. Anubhongte experiences api even asati arte in that which is not real tata 
so apnoti undergoes a Buddha, the unintelligent, bhavam, material existence. As a sleeping person perceives himself, the objects of sense enjoyment and the fruits of his acts within the illusion of a dream, so one who is unintelligent undergoes material existence. Purport. As stated in the Sruti, Asango Pyayam Pung Purusha. The living being has no intimate connection with the material world. This point is explained in the present verse. A similar statement is found in the Srimad Bhagavatam 11.22.56. Arte pyavidyamane pi samsritir na nivartate Dhyayato vishayang asya swapne nartaka mojata. For one who is meditating on sense gratification, material life, although lacking factual existence, does not go away, just as the unpleasant experiences of a dream do not. Om Magyan Timidan Dasya Gyanan Janat Shalakaya Chakshurun Militan Jena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Tadati Svapadantikam Bandeham Sri Guru Sri Juta Padakamalam Sri Guru Vaishnavanscha Sri Rupam Sagrajataham Sahakana Raghunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Pada Sahakana Lalita Sri Vishakan Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindapaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpata Rubyascha Kripasindubya Ebacha Patitanam Bhavanibhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasati Gaura Bhakta Brinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Grateful to be with you today. Hare Krishna. We are reading this morning from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 54, entitled The Marriage of Krishna and Rukmini. Text 48. Could everyone hear? 
because they have a new microphone. <laughs> and my experience is every time there's a new improvement, it creates great disturbance. <laughs> But you could hear? <laughs> thank you, thank you. In today's verse, Lord Balaramji is preaching to Rukmini Devi. Interestingly, the words he's speaking are not so different from the previous chapter where Jarasandha is preaching to Shishupal. The truth that is revealed by Krishna through the Vedas is universal. But the same truths could be utilized by different people for altogether different purposes and thus creating very different results. Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita, Vaidaishta Sarvayar Aham Eva Vedyo Vedanta Krit Veda Vedeva Chaham that by all the Vedas I am to be known. All the Vedic literature, all the great truths spoken by the great spiritual teachers throughout history are meant to awaken the true qualities of the soul that are inherent within all of us. Those qualities are compared like the sun which gives light and life. But when that sun is uh, obscured by a dark cloud, then the sun is shining the same way. The cloud can never um, affect the sun planet, but it does affect our perception. So this cloud of ahankar, or the false ego, it can never affect the atma or the eternal soul. But it can affect our perception. This cloud makes the soul like a sleeping person explained in this verse think that it is the particular personality or form that is undergoing happiness and distress, pleasure, pain, honor, dishonor, birth, death, health, disease within a dream. And we so thoroughly identify with this dream. that we engage in activities that further perpetuate and infatuate the illusion. Jeev Jago, Jeev Jago, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught that spiritual life is simply about waking up, waking up to our true potential. The greatest potential of the soul the eternal nature of the soul is to experience the infinite love of God or Krishna, which is shining everywhere on everyone. And in connecting with Krishna's love, our love awakens completely. Mamai vamsa jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatana. 
because every living being is a part of Krishna as a spirit soul so as Krishna is the supreme lover we are also lovers and as Krishna is the supreme beloved so we also experience that we are his beloved that is truth And all this knowledge is meant to help us to understand that true happiness is in say, seva or bhakti, devotional service. True seva or true love is when our service is unmotivated by any egoism, selfishness, and uninterrupted by any circumstances. Circumstances are always changing. Even within this world, a loving mother, her love for her child and her willingness to serve her child is not determined by circumstances. We see mothers with healthy children and they're doing everything and anything for them. In our congregation, Prajeshwari Devi, Vishwarupra, their little child for many years is physically in a very difficult situation, demanding almost excruciating care. But her love for her child is every bit as much, if not more, than the love for a healthy child of a mother. And she serves 24 hours a day. So this is the nature of unconditional love. And when we actually understand the nature of the soul and Krishna, and the nature of every living being is a part of Krishna, a child of Krishna. Then we awaken to our natural position of service. So this is the goal. The goal is aham brahmasmi. I'm not this body. I'm the eternal soul, beyond birth, beyond death and beyond all the various transformations of this body. In a previous verse in this chapter, Balaram is describing the changes the soul undergoes in life are like the waxing and waning of the moon. Sometimes there's a little crescent moon, which is like a baby. And then there's a quarter moon, which is kind of like an adolescent. Then there's a half moon, which is like a middle-aged person. Then there's a three-quarter moon, which is kind of an older person. Then there's a full moon. Adi <laughs> adi. It's waxing and it's waning. In this sense, a full moon in one sense is when you're at the peak of life. But then you start going, it waxes, and then a full moon, it starts waning and waning until amavasya, which is compared to death, where there's no moon. Now, when we see the amavasya, we don't see the amavasya because we can't see it. There's no moon, but we know the moon is there. The moon is in its full glory. It's just our perception of the moon. So similarly, the eternal soul, when we identify with this body, we're thinking, I am young, I am middle-aged, I am old, or I am about to die. But the soul is transcendental to all of these changes. But the nature of this world is everything is always changing. Nothing is stable. No one can hold on to anything. 
We cannot hold on to our youth. We cannot hold on to our property. We cannot hold on to our skills, or our intelligence. We cannot hold on to our family members. Everything is always changing. But when we understand our spiritual connection with Krishna, and we understand our spiritual connection with all of these things and all these people, then actually we understand that we really do have a relationship. In the Vaishnava philosophy, maya means that which is not. Material energy is not false. It is not in and itself an illusion in the sense that it doesn't exist, it just appears to exist. Material energy is real. It is God's external energy. It is illusory because it's always changing. But the, sum, the substance of prakriti or material ingredients is actually eternal. But always going through transformations. And those transformations appear to be old age, disease, death of a person or a thing. The illusion is when the eternal soul identifies material energy to be myself. Krishna tells in Gita, Daivi Heshu Gunamai Mamamaya Durateya. This divine energy of mine, consisting of the three modes of nature, is very difficult to transcend. In other words, this material energy is divine. It is potentially spiritual. The potential is just in our perception. Spiritual consciousness or consciousness of truth is Sarva Loka Maheshwaram. Everything is Krishna's property meant to be used in Krishna's service. And material consciousness is Janasya Moho Yamahamameti. That I am this body and whatever is in relation to the body is mine. That conception or that misconception is the cause, the root of all suffering and of all chaos within material existence. But when we understand everything is the property of the higher power of Bhagavan, then we understand that my relationship with everything is seva, as a servant, to serve. And in this case, material energy becomes precious. Precious because we're not selfishly attached to it, but because we utilize it for that higher purpose of pleasing Krishna. Some siddhiyad haditoshanam. The perfection and success of anything anyone does is, is it pleasing to Krishna? If not, even the apparent success of this world only aggravates the illusions that cause us to suffer. True liberation is such a simple concept that I'm Krishna's eternal servant and everything is Krishna's and everyone is Krishna's child. To live with compassion, to live with love. Bhaktaram Jagatapasam. And Krishna tells in Gita this is the peace formula. So Jarasandha is taking these incredibly invaluable truths from the scriptures. But because of his ahankar, his false ego, he's completely misrepresenting them. 
the truth themselves he's not representing, he's not misrepresenting, in the sense that the, um, the immediate situation that Shishupa was in, Jarasandha was giving him really good advice. But the misconception was the final purpose of what it's all for. Jarasandha is teaching Shishupala that this philosophy that everything is always changing within this world, that we are the eternal souls and ultimately God is the supreme controller of everything. This is what Jarasandha is teaching. He was telling him this so that you can, even in, this, in the instance of a great failure, where he lost his pride, he lost his, that, that person that he was so obsessed with having, Rukmini. And he lost the battle to protect her, so he's totally humiliated in front of all of his relatives and all of his friends and all the people he was always eager to show off his prowess and impress. He was completely humiliated. So Jarasandha is saying, don't be attached to these things. Eventually, you'll get what you want. Just be patient. Time is not on your side at this moment. So just keep trying, be patient, and when time is right, when destiny is correct, you will get. So Shishupa was a little pacified. So to serve that temporary purpose of pacifying Shishupal and giving him some light in his darkness, it worked. But the problem was the ultimate conclusion was off. Because he's saying that God's the ultimate controller of everything, so just wait for his grace. But the problem is Krishna was God. <laughs> and it was Krishna he was fighting with and against. So here we find, in the name of religion or God, we can take so many eternal truths, and it's happened, and it's always happening, and it will always happen in this material world. And we give enough of the truth to it, and apply it to life, that people have faith in it. But like Jarasandha, it created animosity and hatred. That was its purpose. But Balaram is speaking the highest truths. And he's speaking them for the right purpose. Just like Srila Prabhupada explained, Krishna does not see everything that is offered to him. But Krishna sees and accepts the purpose in which it is offered. And this holds true in our spiritual life too. Is our purpose, Sharanagati, to surrender our false ego and live with as a in the pure love of a servant, of the servant, of a servant? Or are we using the same philosophical ideas, the same facilities that have been uh, created for Krishna for our own egos? That is ultimately what Krishna sees. Rukmini, in this verse, in this chapters, she gave her heart to Krishna unconditionally. And she made her desire known to her father, her brother. And it was supposed to be arranged that she marry Krishna. Because ultimately Rukmini is 
Sri Radharani who manifests in Dwarka. She's Krishna's eternal pleasure potency, the goddess of fortune, Ladini Shakti. Shishupal, interestingly, his whole life, his obsession was his envy of Krishna. He was the son of Chedi Raj. That means his father had a great kingdom with inconceivable wealth. Shishupal had unbelievable power physically, financially, in every way. He had everything. But he was obsessed with envy of Krishna. And anything Krishna did that people liked agitated him terribly. So Urukmini loved Krishna. And Shishupal wanted Rukmini. Rukmini made it clear she wanted to marry Krishna. But because she was so beautiful and so wonderful, Rukmini wanted, a Shishupa wanted for himself. And in his obsession, he became totally attached to her. Not only his mind and his senses, but especially his ego. Because this would have been the greatest triumph against Krishna, which is what he longed for. But Rukmini had no affection. And it's really interesting because Rukmini when she wrote to Krishna, she said that Shishupal and his associates are like jackals. And I'm like the little lamb. And I'm meant to be given to the lion. But the jackals are going to steal me away. Uh, this is her conception. They are jackals, but I am meant to be the property of a lion like you. That was Rukmini's perception. But we read here in the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam that Rukmi, who was Rukmini's brother, after Krishna took Rukmini away, he, who was very good friends with Shishupal, he was thinking that Rukmini is like sacrificial butter. She's my sister. She's like the ghee. And she's meant to be offered to the Supreme. But Krishna is like a crow that stole her away. So they're brother and sister. Rukmi is seeing Krishna as the jackal and Shishupal is the lion. And Rukmini is seeing Shishupal is the jackal and Krishna is the lion. So in this way, perception is very interesting in this world. According to the nature of our ego. And this is the basic root of why there's so much conflict. And everybody has their philosophy, their sociological um, explanations of why they're right. So is Rukmi right or is Rukmini right? Nobody could convince Rukmi and nobody could convince Rukmini. So Rukmi, when Krishna took Rukmini away, he vowed. He said, until and unless I kill Krishna and bring my sister back, I will never again come into my city of Kundina. And then he attacked Krishna. 
And Krishna was so kind, he gave him every chance. Krishna took Rukmini because Rukmini wanted to be with Krishna. <laughs> he was satisfying her desire. She was being exploited, abused, manipulated in the worst way. And Krishna came to rescue her. Well, Rukmini, so Rukmini attacked. And it describes here in the Srimad Bhagavatam, he came chasing after Krishna with his whole army and began to shout the most terrible words to Krishna. And Krishna tolerated them. Then Ruk Rukmi challenged him to fight. and proclaimed that he was going to kill him. Krishna tolerated. Then Rukmini started shooting arrows in Krishna's body. <laughs> they were actually entering Krishna's body. And Krishna did not shoot Ruk Rukmi. After getting all these arrows in his own body, Krishna shot an arrow that broke Rukmi's chariot so he couldn't ride behind him so fast anymore. Then Ruk Rukmi from the ground started shooting at Krishna, hitting him. And Krishna broke Rukmi's bow. Didn't hit Rukmi, just broke his bow. Krishna was showing Rukmi that you shouldn't do this. <laughs> I'm trying to protect you. So what did Rukmi do? He picked up another ball. And Krishna, he started shooting Krishna's body. And Krishna took another arrow and broke that bow. And bow after bow after bow, he kept getting new bows. Then he, when he was out of bows, he took clubs and bludgeons and tridents and, and, and javelins and all types of other weapons and hurled them at Krishna. And <laughs> Krishna just destroyed all the weapons, but didn't do anything to Rukmi. He's given him another chance. And finally, when there was nothing else, Rukmi picked up a sword and physically ran to Krishna to attack him. Krishna broke the sword and the shield. When is this man going to learn? <laughs> Doesn't he see that Krishna could easily kill him in a second, but he's not. He's given him another chance, another chance, another chance. And Rukmi comes with his own hands to kill Krishna. So, what, so Krishna finally takes his arrow. Okay, I've given you so many opportunities to learn. Now, this is what I have to do. It's interesting because Krishna gives everybody so many chances. As devotees, sometimes Krishna sees that we're off and, he's, and he just he gives us a little punishment. <laughs> it's not really a punishment in this sense. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an act of love for rectification. But then we persist to do it again and again and again, and Krishna gives us chance after chance after chance, and ultimately, all right, if this is the only way to learn your lesson, I'll let you go through it. So when Krishna was ultimately about to finally liberate Rukmi, because he just wouldn't learn his lesson, Krishna was so kindly giving him chance after chance, message after message, but he wouldn't relent in his misbehavior. So finally, when there was no other alternative, and Rukmini was about to be slain by Krishna. 
his sister Rukmini began to cry. And she fell at Krishna's feet and begged him, please don't hurt my brother. How compassionate she was. And Krishna, of course, always obliges to the prayers of compassion of his beloved devotees. This is an eternal, universal truth. Kaliya was something like Rukmi. He actually killed all the cows and the cowherd boys. He actually killed them all. That's how cruel he was with the poisons of his waters. Krishna glanced upon them and brought them back to life. As we who are poor, we may be poisoned by so many um, attachments and aversions and so many misconceptions and so much influence. But when Krishna casts his glance upon us, we become completely purified. We come back to our original natural life. And then Krishna jumped in the water and Kaliya, Kaliya was such, was such an egomaniac person. He could not tolerate anybody coming into his water because he considered, I am the proprietor, I am the enjoyer, I am the controller. So he attacked Krishna. And he had gigantic poisonous fangs. He was a snake. And he bit Krishna. And he attacked Krishna to destroy him. And Krishna jumped on top of his hood, his head, and danced. Beautiful dance. He was smiling. He danced from hood to hood to hood. And Kaliya all along was trying to kill him. Why didn't Kaliya learn his lesson? <laughs> He's so powerful and Krishna's just a little sweet cowherd boy. And with all of his powers and force and mystical yogic cities, he's trying to destroy Krishna. And Krishna's effortlessly dancing, smiling. And people, on the sh people are singing for him as he's dancing. Such a dance. And finally, when Krishna's feet, which to the gopis were softer than the finest petal of a lotus flower, but those same feet were as hard as the most destructive thunderbolts to Kaliya. And ultimately he didn't give up until he was completely um, exhausted. All of his poisons he vomited out. He had no powers left. And it was at that point that his wives, the Nagapatnis, lady, who was, who had deep, simple devotion, prayed to Krishna, please protect our husband. Now he's humbled <laughs> by the situation. Please give him your shelter. And Kaliya heard the prayers of, his wa of, of the Nagapatnis, his wives, at that moment, and he under he actually learned from them. They were trying to teach him all the time, but he would never listen. Nagapatni's always tried to preach to Kali in whatever way, because they were always pure-hearted devotees. But it wasn't until he was in such a completely helpless condition that he heard what they spoke, and now he believed them. And he spoke the same prayers to Krishna. And he was liberated. In another sense, Indra. Indra, he's a deva. Very, very powerful devotee. But even devotees can have false egos. 
not supposed to. But until we become purified of our false egos, we simply choose not to follow the dictations of the false ego. We, fire, we follow the principles of the higher self, which is given by the guru, by the sadhu, by the shastras. So Indra tried to destroy Krishna and all of Krishna's family and cows and the whole of Vrindavan. Krishna seeing torrents of storms coming down, he lifted Govardhan Hill with the little finger of his left hand and held it up for seven days and seven nights. And ultimately, but just by seeing that, Indra woke up from the slumber of his egoism. Just see, Krishna, Indra was trying to destroy Krishna. And Krishna killed so many demons in Vrindavan. Why didn't he do something to Indra? He wanted to give him a chance. So he lifted the hill because Indra was actually a good devotee. He didn't, he was just, he was a devotee with ultimately good intentions who was really distracted due to his arrogance and pride. So when he realized what kind of terrible things I have done, he went to Brahm, he went to Brihaspati, his guru, and said, what should I do? Brihaspati said, you tried to destroy Krishna's family. We should go to Brahma. Brahma said, you have to get a simple-hearted devotee to pray for you, and then everything will be in order. So he went to Surabi, who's a cow, a mother cow, and she went to Krishna along with Indra, and she prayed, please forgive him. And Krishna forgave him. So here Rukmini Devi, is praying for Rukmi. And Krishna will always answer the prayers of his devotees. Nityananda Prabhu, when Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was about to utilize his Sudarshan Chakra against Jagai and Madhai, Nityananda's prayers ultimately restored Jagai and Madhai. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave them pure devotional service. So Rukmini is praying to Krishna, please spare him. And Krishna very mercifully takes a piece of cloth and ties Rukmi up so he can't do any more damage. And then to teach him a very mild lesson, Krishna shaves off just a part of his mustache, a part of his hair, and makes him look, what you would say, quite silly. Now for most, because hair grows back on your mustache, and it's not gonna last for very long, just a few days of looking strange. Of course, if he shaved his head, nobody would see any, but he wasn't willing to do that. So he looked strange. And Balaram, he actually, in order to um, give happiness to Rukmini, to pacify her, he said, why have you given such harsh punishment to Rukmi? You have dishonored him by shaving him in this way. He's a family member. He's an intimate family member. We should not create such disturbance. And when Rukmini saw that Balaram was so affectionate toward her brother, then her heart opened a lot. And then Balaram started preaching to Rukmini. You see, in trying to enlighten people, we have to open their hearts first. We have to give people the understanding that we really are their well-wishers. 
that we really do care about them. Otherwise, we can speak truth, but unless people believe we really want to help them, we really love them and care about them, who wants to hear truth? What use does it? When Srila Prabhupada came to America, he was speaking truths that, very, very high truths. He was citing Sanskrit verses that nobody ever heard before. But because they saw this man loves us and cares about us more than anybody we've ever experienced, their hearts totally opened and then those truths completely transformed their lives. So Balaram kind of chastises Krishna <laughs> just to get Rukmini to understand in her plight of, of, of passion to protect her brother that I'm also concerned with your brother. And then he speaks to Rukmini. And he's speaking about <clears throat> One incredible verse he says. Blinded by conceit with their personal opulences, proud men offend others for the sake of such things as kingdom, land, wealth, women, honor, and power. world history is full of such situations. He says blinded by conceit. It's a very powerful analogy. When we have this false ego we become blinded by it. In other words we cannot see as it is. We become so blinded that we think everyone else is blind. And we think that we see. But whether it's the East or the West or the Middle or the Mideast or the Midwest, anywhere you look in the world's geographical um, locations or throughout time there's always these great conquerors who just have to conquer others and when they become obsessed that I want to be the proprietor because they're blinded by their opulences by their strength by their by their influence by their wealth whatever it may be then they think they have the right to be cruel or offensive to others. This is why Kunti Devi has given her prayer that only a person who is a kinch and a gotram can, you, can know you, who you for who you are, Krishna. Only a person who does not have this false ego obsessed that I have knowledge, I have strength, I have beauty, I have high birth, I have wealth. Akinchana Gotra means to understand that all these things are entrusted in my care. They are all Krishna's property. Everything is meant to be utilized for Krishna's purpose. And Krishna's purpose is to help all living beings be happy in their original natural spiritual position. But when we're blinded by these things, then we, are, we fall into the ignorance 
that I have rights of, over others. For my purpose, I could kill, I could torture, I could abuse. And so much suffering. How many conquerors are there? And like these people, like Shishupala and Jarasandha, throughout history, these conquerors, many, there's little conquerors living in the household, abusing you know, their family members, because I am the Lord and Master. Or there's people who do it in, in the political world, or the business world, or the scientific technological world. And then there are those who get so much power, they accumulate massive armies, ammunition, artillery, and attack and conquer. India was conquered so many times by different foreign invaders. And the whole world, the history is like that. Where in the world do we find anywhere that was not at one time or another conquered by foreign invaders? Well, whether it was Alexander the Great, or whether it was the Roman Empire, or whether it was the Mughal Empire, or whether it was the British Empire. So many empires, so many rulers, the Mughal, the, the Mongolian Empire. They would just come in and plunder and take and kill and control. And the whole world has been through so many phases of different people conquering them. But how long does it last? They last a few centuries. But then we see throughout history, nobody could hold on to anything for very long. A few hundred years may seem long for us. But when you look back in history at it, it doesn't seem very long at all. It only seems long when you're living in it. Well, just like in India, Mughals for many centuries, British for many centuries. And now we're sitting here with nice government and everything. And <laughs> nice new government. You know, oh, that was in the past. But if you were living at that time, it seemed for a long time. So that's how time works. It's always moving. And nothing is for very long if we see it from the perspective of eternity. And once something's past, it just seems like a dream of the past. But so many lessons. So Balaram is addressing Krishna and telling him that all these kings, they're, they're willing to create so much harm for land, wealth, women, honor, and power. Because maya, the illusory energy, makes us think makes us forget our real selves and thus taking the body for the self they consider others to be friends enemies or neutral parties this is the basic principle that Prahlad Maharaj disagreed with his teachers he was in the best school in the world in Hiranyakashipu's school for the elite. <laughs> he obviously had other schools because it was, he, he ruled over the universe. But this was the top-notch school. This was the IIT, the Oxford, <laughs> the, the Harvard, and beyond. Sanda and Amarika, Shukracharya, a very high school. And they were teaching Prahlad and his classmates every subject with such depth. 
and precision, the science of training them. But Prahlad Maharaj just saw everything from a very simple devotional perspective. That whatever you're teaching, all the sciences, all the mathematics, all the chivalrous um, arts, they are all not acceptable to me. Because the foundational principle of all of this is how to utilize them. Utilize our knowledge, our science, our technology in a sense that this person is my friend and this person is my enemy and this person is a neutral party. That means it's all based on the false ego of I and mine. And because of that false ego, we have all of these conceptions. He said, but I see everyone as, a, as part of Krishna. I'm a servant of everyone. That is my understanding, what I learned from my guru. So all these sciences and technologies and all this academic knowledge can be utilized for great purposes if we have this foundational truth that we build it upon. Jivera Swarupoy Krishna Das. That we're eternally servants. Everything is the property of Krishna. Bhakti Yoga is to understand how everything is the property of Krishna. And to awaken our love through the chanting of the holy names. And thus to utilize everything according to this truth. As a sleeping person perceives himself, the objects of sense enjoyment, and the fruits of his acts within the illusion of a dream, so one who is unintelligent undergoes material existence. And Balaram explains to Rukmini, but when one, therefore with transcendental knowledge, dispel the grief that is weakening and confounding your mind, Please resume your natural mood, O princess of the pristine smile. And hearing these words from Balaram, Rukmini becomes completely pacified and happy. And Rukmi, he was so aggrieved because of he tried to kill Krishna in every possible way. He was abusive, he was harsh. Krishna didn't speak any words against him. He didn't cause any, didn't shoot a shoot single arrow into him. He just cut a few hairs off his face. <laughs> That's all. But he was so outraged. He took a vow, he would not go back to Kundina, his own kingdom. So he never, his whole life, went back there to his own kingdom. But this is very symbolic of a conditioned soul. Do you know what he did? In his honor, he never went to, back to Kundina. So where he was standing, where he was defeated by Krishna, with all the power and the wealth and the influence he had, he built another kingdom. An incredible city right there in that place so he could still enjoy the same things while while not going back to his other Kundina home just to show people how he was so renounced <laughs> <laughs> he was so renounced he would not break his vow so he built a better city in another place and he maintained the same enmity the same envy. You see, the nature of ahankar, or false ego, is it creates a fertile field 
within our hearts, our minds, where the seeds of envy can grow. And that it is those seeds of envy that cause us to speak and do so many things that are um, totally unnatural to the soul, implicate us in so much karma in illusion, and cause so much sorrow and grief to people and to the world. So Rukmi, those seeds of envy, even though he saw Balaram, he heard Balaram's words, he was sitting right there. He saw Rukmini's prayers, he saw Krishna's compassion to him, but he interpreted it all through the lens of his polluted ego. And he maintained his vow to get revenge in his new city. And meanwhile, in the next few verses of this chapter, Krishna brings Rukmini to Dwarka. And the people of Dwarka, they were so happy. Jarasandha, Shishupal, they were so sad. <laughs> but the people of Dwarka were so happy. Here Krishna is coming with Rukmini, the most, the most virtuous, pious, loving bride. And they had a wonderful wedding ceremony. There's nice descriptions of how the whole city of Dwaraka and the island and the ocean was decorated so wonderfully just for the pleasure of Rukmini and Krishna. And everyone was so joyous. You see in Dwarka, every man saw that Rukmini is the most beautiful person there is. And every lady is thinking Krishna is the most beautiful person there is. But they were happy because Krishna and Rukmini were enjoying together. No one in Dwarka was thinking, no ladies were thinking, Krishna should be with me. And no men were thinking, Rukmini should be with me. They were all literally in the ecstasy of the highest happiness because Krishna was with Rukmini and Rukmini was with Krishna. Same principle we find throughout. Ravana wanted Sita for himself. Hanuman wanted Sita to be, to, to be with Ram. That's the difference between material consciousness and spiritual consciousness. When we see Krishna and Rukmini together enjoying, when we see Radha in Vrindavan, everyone's happiness is just how Radha and Krishna are happy together. That's the ultimate happiness. No one is thinking, why not me? It is this purity of heart that is awakened as we chant the holy name. <laughs> Is there any questions? Yes, Mataji's. Can you send? Microphone is coming. My respects at your lotus feet. Uh, Krishna in the Gita always tells us to remember him always. So how does we remember, how do we remember him while we do our chanting and second while we do our routine duties? Hare Krishna. <laughs> this Kali Kare Nama Rupe Krishna Vata. That Krishna and his name are non different. So simply by focusing our consciousness on hearing the sound of the name, 
we are in full absorption and remembering Krishna. That is the easiest way. And as we make progress in Krishna consciousness, Krishna become, more and more reveals himself within the sound of his holy names. Reveals his form, his pastimes, his qualities, his abode. Golokera premadana harinam sankirta. The spiritual world has descended from Goloka and it, reveal, it opens the doors for us to realize within that sound vibration, Goloka. It's very transcendental um, science. The holy name of Krishna has descended from Goloka and the holy name of Krishna is Goloka. We could actually experience and realize Goloka as we Sharanagati, as we surrender to the holy names. And in our daily activities, if through satsang, association of devotees, through our sadhana, our spiritual practice, through our sadachar, our devotional, humble behavior, if we follow these principles nicely, then we will be able to actually understand how whatever we do, we're yat karoshi adasnasi, yat jahoshi We're doing it for Krishna. So in our work, whether it be at home or in school or in office or wherever it may be, if through association, through sadhana, through our good con our good conduct, we are we have an awareness that whatever we do, it's, just, it's for Krishna ultimately. And then our work becomes bhakti. We can be absorbed in Krishna. Yes. Raja, I, I used to have this doubt. Uh, in this uh, chapter, Bhishmaka had two children, Rukmi and Rukmini. Now he was a devotee. He gave Krishna consciousness in his family. And although he gave Krishna consciousness in his family, yet one person became a devotee and one person became almost a demon. So sometimes this doubt comes in our life. That when a family, in a, the devotee family, well, the husband and the wife, they both are committed to Krishna consciousness and they have more than one children. And sometimes, <laughs> and, and sometimes we see that one child has become a very serious devotee and another child has become absolutely opposite child. Means not at all taking Krishna consciousness. On the contrary, the child is becoming more on a demonic lifetime, lifestyle. So at that time, the doubt comes in our mind that the parents have given Krishna consciousness equally to both of them. Both of them have been given Krishna consciousness from the childhood. Yet one person has become a devotee and another person didn't accept it. So is it the child's karma or the destiny is more important than the culture that has been given by the parents? If that is the case, then why should we give so much emphasis on giving culture to the children? Because the child is not going to become a devotee then in due course of time. So can you just clear this doubt? <laughs> is that why you only had one child? His one child, Raghunath, is a wonderful devotee. In fact, his little child, Raghunath, is such a good devotee that he makes clothes not only for his own deities and nice things for 
deities of our congregation, but he makes clothes for the Radha Raman temple in Vrindavan. <laughs> That got bigger applause than your question. <laughs> the fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam tells that it's the first and foremost duty of a parent to raise the child in an atmosphere that the child never has to take birth again in this material world. So that is a great responsibility. At the same time, everyone has their free will. Even in Chaitanya Charitamrita, we read about Advaita Charya. He had six children. And three were pure Paramahamsa great devotees. And three actually went against his teachings. So oh, that free will is always there for everyone. But at the same time, it's the parents' first and foremost duty to give every child the chance. Just like Krishna, yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata. He keeps coming to the world again and again. Yes? He comes as matsya. He comes as Kurma, Varaha, Narasinga, Parasuram. He comes as Ram, as Buddha. He comes as Krishna. In other places in the world, he sends his prophets or his sons or his devotees to manifest the same truth of Sanatan Dharma to give all the people of the world the opportunity. Because if Krishna doesn't come to give the opportunity, nobody has a chance of coming out of this illusion. But however many times Krishna comes in this world or God descends into this world, some people are going to follow and some people are not. Because we all have free will. Krishna never forces. But still he keeps coming. He came as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to make it so free and easy to everyone. And they're all his children. Aham Bija Purata Pita. Krishna comes because every living being is his son and daughter. And he's coming to teach them the right thing. By his example, Lord Ramchandra taught the highest examples of every way just to show us and some people followed. Hanuman, Sugriva, Maharaj Guha. So many people followed. Vibhishan. This was brothers. Ravana, Vibhishan. They were brothers. Vibhishan was the greatest devotee of Ram. And Ravana was the worst enemy of Ram. But Ram was giving both of them the same opportunity for the same perfection, but they had their free will. So Krishna comes again and again, and some people will take Krishna's words and example and become happy in their natural, pure devotion. And others will not accept. So as a parent, you're just, a, you're a, caretaker of Krishna's children. And you're meant to do what Krishna wants for your children. Which means provide the example and the opportunities for them to become perfect. Because if you don't, there's hardly a chance. And if you do, there's a very good chance. But still, they have their free will. Just like all the rest of us. So why would Krishna descend into this world? He could just say, well, 
It's destiny. No one will listen to me or everybody will listen to me. Destiny is created by our choices today. Whatever our destiny may have been in the past, Krishna descends to intervene. And devotees, their purpose in this world is to intervene with people's destiny. To open the doors to the higher reality beyond karmic consequences. So being a parent in Krishna consciousness by living in the example, that's actually the path of perfection for ourselves. Srila Prabhupada was a pure devotee. There was no question of his being implicated in karma. But still, even in his state, he gave so much credit to his mother and father. He said every morning when he would wake up, he would see his parents performing the arti of Radha Govinda. And every evening, his mother and father would invite sadhus, holy men, to his house and feed them prasad before the family would eat. And after, and after very lovingly, caringly serving these sadhus, every night the father would ask, please bless my son that he will be a devotee of Sri Radha. He never asked anything for himself. The father never asked, give me this or give me that. Give my son pure devotion to Sri Radha. And Srila Prabhupada grew up in that environment. And he saw the whole world as his own children. And that was his prayer. When he was on the Jala Juta, he offered this prayer. Krishna, let everyone become your devotees and find that happiness beyond the sufferings of material existence. So it is the sacred duty of a parent to do everything within their powers. It's, it's the path of a parent's perfection themselves to live in this spirit. And it opens the doors to the highest liberations for the children. But still, every child has their choice to follow or not to follow. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you, Maharaj, for a wonderful class. Maharaj, as you were telling in the class I, that... You always say like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your wonderful encouragement. As in the class you were telling that Rukmi saw Krishna in different way and Rukmini saw Krishna in different way. So it's a world of perception and everyone has their perceptions and they firmly believe in the perception. So therefore there are conflicts. So I just wanted to know in such scenario how a sadhaka should really perceive through and keep his means vision fixed in serving Guru and Krishna where you know he sees such situations do come in life. The Srimad Bhagavatam tells Nasta prayeshya badreshu nityam bhagavati sevaya. Bhagavati uttama sloke bhaktir bhavati naishti. That by regularly hearing from the Srimad Bhagavat, from the scriptures, and by regularly associating with person Bhagavats, people who live by their example, these teachings, then this spiritual foundation becomes very strong within us. It keeps our focus, our perception, very 
clear. Otherwise, this world, in this age of Kali especially, there's so much fog of misconceptions, of illusions everywhere. Limitless distractions. But we keep tuned in to the frequency of Krishna's grace, Sri Radha's grace, when we regularly, on a daily basis, as much as possible, hear from the Srimad Bhagavatam and associate with people who are living examples of Srimad Bhagavatam, devotees. Sadhu Sangha. It's crucial. Otherwise, without hearing in the association of enlightened people, it is inevitable that we will be distracted and confused. So we should take this very seriously. Then we can truly take shelter of keeping our hearts and minds focused on Krishna through the chanting of his holy name. I request you to chant much louder, Today for the Sunday festival, we will be graced by the divine association of His Holiness Giridaj Swami Maharaj. Thank you very much. <laughs>